As Shana mentioned, we're going to be talking about some commonly confused and misidentified species here in Florida. There's lots that we could discuss, but I had to pick and choose a few. So know that this is not all that we could be discussing today. And that might come to you in the 2018 webinar series. So today, what we're going to be doing is comparing two different species, which we're going to call, is it this or that? And so we'll explore um, a variety of species from birds to mammals and reptiles. So this is one example of what we'll be going through today. And so I'll just ask for a raise of hand if you know the difference between these two species. So just raise your hand if you're like, yes, I know which is which. Looks like we've got some professionals in the group today. Awesome. Okay, so if you knew correctly, hopefully this is what you were thinking. So on the top we have a bald eagle. Um, it's actually an immature bald eagle. So they look quite different from the mature bald eagle. And on the bottom we have the osprey, sometimes called the fish hawk. So this is what the bald eagle looks like as a mature adult, what we often think of when we think of a bald eagle with the white head, white tail, um, and kind of a solid brown throughout. The ospreys look pretty consistently the same um, from juvenile to adult. Uh, some of the ways you can tell them apart, one is in flight, you can kind of make it out here, but the osprey will hold its wings in kind of a V shape typically when it's flying, whereas the bald eagle will have them very straight out if you ever get the chance to see them flying together, which I had the opportunity to see recently, the size of the bald eagle is significantly larger than that of the osprey. So size alone can also be helpful. Um, and then if we look close up, if you're able to see the head of these, either of these species, the osprey has, let me get out my pointer here. Maybe, maybe not. Well, you can see my mouse, hopefully. Um, so you can see on the osprey, they have this brown eye stripe here, which the bald eagle lacks. Their head is just solid white when they're mature. And if you look at the chest of the two species, the osprey has a white chest compared to a solid brown of the bald eagle. So just a couple things that you can look for there. So that's what we'll be exploring today. That's just a little example. We'll explore a few more bird species, kind of avoiding the ones that James talked about in our previous webinar, um, since he already discussed those. And if you missed that, you can check it out on our YouTube channel. We'll look at one mammal comparison and then a few reptiles and amphibians. So we'll look at our next comparison here for bird species. Uh, one that you can pretty much see uh, very often up in the sky, most often in this way, looking up uh, at the underside of these two, which on the top we have the black vulture and um, below is the turkey vulture, which you could just call a vulture and you'd be good. But if you want to know how to tell them apart, I'll tell you now. So if we look here, um, at the top we have the turkey vulture. So one thing to look at is the head. Um, again, kind of similar to the eagle. Um, as a comparison point, the turkey vultures have a red head compared to the black head of the black vulture. And if you're more familiar with the wild turkey, the male wild turkeys will often have a red head. So you can maybe remember it that way. They both have red heads. That's the turkey vulture. Um, it is worthy of noting that turkey vultures do have black heads when they're immature. So um, more often you're probably gonna see them when they're mature and you'll be able to note that red head, but it's not always the case. Um, another thing that you can look at is uh, looking at them from the underside, which again is how we often see them in flight. You can notice they look different in terms of the coloration. So at the top, the turkey vulture, if you look at the darker coloration, it forms a T. So you can think T for turkey vulture um, compared to the black vulture, which only has the lighter coloration just at the tips. 
for me, and this is corny, but maybe you'll remember it better this way. I think of a black tip shark. So the tips of the black vulture wings are lighter in color. It works for me. Whatever works for you, if you just want to go with the T for the turkey vulture, awesome. So those are some different ways to tell these apart. Um, when the vultures are circling up in the air, they're riding on thermals, hot air rising from the ground. Um, and often the black vultures will be flying higher in that circle using um, their eyesight to spot potential food. And the turkey vultures use their noses. They tend to fly a little bit lower using their scent of, or sense of smell to identify um, food. So before we get into another comparison, it's important to talk about why these comparisons are so critical in the natural resource world. So let's go to poll question one. So true or false, it is important to identify species accurately because some management decisions depend on the presence or absence of certain species, especially those listed as threatened, endangered, or invasive. All right, I think we got pretty much everybody. I will share the results because you got it, true. Starting off with a little bit of an easy one, but um, we'll dive into some of these that are listed as well as invasive species so you can get a better idea of how they might be confused and why it's important to tell them apart. So this one is a pretty challenging one, I think. Um, especially I, when I'm just kind of listening to people, they often get misidentified. So you can see here, they look quite similar upon first glance. Um, so we're gonna be looking at the cormorant, which is the species on the top versus the anhinga on the bottom. If you see them in this posture, a couple things to note to tell them apart is one is the coloration on the wings. So if you note on the cormorant, it's a pretty consistent uh, black or dark brown color, whereas the anhinga will have some white kind of patches on their wings. And if you look at the tail, the tail of the cormorant is much shorter. It's kind of a stubbier tail versus the longer tail of the anhinga. And the anhinga tails also uh, are tipped with a lighter coloration, like a little stripe at the bottom. So those are two things to note in a posture like this. And you can also, if you get a chance to look up close, note the difference in the bill. So you can see on the anhinga, it's a very sharp pointed bill compared to this very heavy kind of hook and curved bill of the cormorant. So the anhinga use this to spear their prey underwater, whereas the cormorant will use it to hook, just kind of grab their prey and and hook onto them that way. So their approach at prey is different and their bill is designed uh, to accommodate that. Another thing you can look for is if you see these two species swimming, they're both found uh, near water, wetland, aquatic environments. So the cormorant, when it's swimming, the majority of its body is above water, whereas the anhinga, the majority of its body is underwater and all you see is its head. And when it's doing that, some people call it the snake bird because it kind of looks like a snake standing up out of the water. It's a strange sight when you just, it catches you off guard. So hopefully between those things, you'll now have those two species down pat. Okay, I think this is the last of our bird comparisons for today. We're gonna to be looking at two woodpecker species specifically the red-bellied woodpecker, which is on the top, and the red-headed woodpecker, which is on the bottom. So usually I feel like this is mostly a name. They, they look quite different, but people will often refer to the red-bellied woodpecker as the red-headed woodpecker because it has red on its head, appropriately so. Um, however, if you look at the red-headed woodpecker, you can see it's a solid red compared to just the stripe on the back 
of the head on the red-bellied woodpecker. So that's one thing to look for. Another is on the wings. Comparing the two, you can see on the red-bellied woodpecker, some people call this like a salt and pepper look, a very even mix of black and white compared to the red-headed woodpecker, which has very solid black wings with just one patch of white. And one other thing to note, if you're able to see the bill of the two species, you can see that the red-bellied woodpecker has a darker bill compared to that of the red-headed woodpecker, which has a lighter bill. Um, in general, the red-bellied woodpecker is a much more common species, especially uh, they're more adaptable to urban areas, whereas the red-headed wood woodpecker is often only found in natural areas. So it's a special treat, at least for me, to see a red-headed woodpecker. I've only seen a handful in my lifetime. So hopefully y'all have an opportunity to see one and properly identify it. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna look at our first mammal species comparison, which some might say, well, it's very obvious which is which. But Shannon and I quite often say, get people that have seen sightings of panthers, which are often misidentified as a bobcat. So just gonna review um, some differences between these two. So first off, the Florida panther is uh, federally designated as threatened, so it's a, very rare, I've personally never seen one in the wild, um, compared to the bobcat, which is much more common, though they're both uh, nocturnal, mostly active at night, so that also reduces our chances of seeing them. But we'll start off with the tail of the two species, the bobcat appropriately named for its short bob tail, on average between four and six inches compared to the very long tail of the Florida panther, which is between 20 and 30 inches. So, you know, sometimes over two feet in length, which is pretty long. The tail of the bobcat is also striped, which is something to note. Um, and speaking of patterns, you can notice on the Florida panther, their coat is pretty consistent um, in terms of the coloration. It's kind of a rusty brown, yellow, tawny. There's different adjectives used to describe um, but in general, a solid color versus the spotted coat of the bobcat. And again, size in general, the Florida panther is significantly larger, um, up to I think over 120 pounds compared to just the average weight of a bobcat, which is 35. So much larger at maturity for the Florida panther. Now, sometimes we don't get the opportunity to see the actual animal, but we'll see tracks. So with cat tracks, they're not leaving any claw marks because they retract their claws. But if you see what looks like a wild cat track, um, size alone could differentiate between these two. So you can see the cougar or the Florida panther is about twice the size of that of the track of a bobcat. So we'll do our next poll question. So I mentioned that, let me get this up, that the Florida panther is listed at the federal level, but at the state level here in Florida, which agency is responsible for listing species as state designated threatened or species of special concern? Waiting for giving some time. Okay, we'll end in a couple seconds. All right. So I will share these. So the majority of you got it correct. It is the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. At the federal level, it's the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Obviously, there's collaboration among all of these agencies in general, but for the actual listing designation, the Florida Fish and Wildlife does that for um, the state level designations. All 
Okay, so my fair warning for this next segment, we're gonna be switching and talking about snakes. So if you saw any of our recent social media posts, these were the two that species that were featured. So if you were anxiously awaiting to know who is who, here is that information. So on the top we have the Florida water snake and on the bottom is the cottonmouth or water moccasin, which is one of the venomous, venomous species that we have here in the state. And so to tell them apart, you've probably heard for venomous uh, versus non-venomous to look at the pupils. Round pupils mean non-venomous and kind of the cat eyes are venomous. So you can see that here, the round pupils of the Florida water snake versus the kind of slit pupil of the water moccasin. Now, I do not encourage anyone to be like, oh, I need to see the pupil, let me get up close. <laughs> do this from a safe distance if you have binoculars or a zoom lens on your camera. Um, or there's tons of other ways to tell them apart. So that's just one. The other is looking at kind of near the eye region and below. If you look at the Florida water snake, they have pretty, there are several species of water snakes in Florida and most of them have these vertical lines on their lower jaw area. I call them fake teeth, whatever it looks like to you. Um, that's an easy way for me to distinguish the two. And then if you look at kind of that same general area on the water moccasin, they have a distinct brown eye stripe, which actually even runs through the eye, but all of them will have that. So you can look at the head to really tell them apart. And again, looking at the head, <laughs> um, venomous snakes in general, you've probably heard also that they have a blockier, larger triangular shaped head. So you can kind of see that here with the water moccasin on the left. Again, that brown eye stripe, large blocky head. And then over here is the Florida water snake. Uh, you can see the head is not as distinct. It's more round and kind of just goes right from the body into the head. So important to know the difference between those two, um, venomous and non-venomous snakes. And now we'll look at one more. So this is a pretty fun one. We're gonna look at the juvenile black racer, which is a species on the top and a pygmy rattlesnake, which is the one on the bottom, another venomous species here in Florida. And believe it or not, that is a black racer on the top. And I'll show you that in a minute. So again, we can look at the pupils. The, the eyes on the juvenile black racer are quite large. So sometimes that is easy to see. Um, on the pygmy rattlesnake, definitely not as much. But again, if you have the opportunity to look, that's one way to tell them apart. If we go back to this slide, the body thickness alone can also be helpful in identifying the two. The black racers, especially the juvenile black racers, are much skinnier than the heavier bodied pygmy rattlesnake. Another thing you can note is the scales of the two species. So <clears throat> again, the juvenile black racer is in this bottom left corner and they become this as ma mature adults, solid black with a white chin. But you can see the scales are very smooth. They're very shiny when the light hits them right compared to the pygmy rattlesnake, which has much rougher scales. It's kind of hard to show this with pictures, but hopefully you can kind of see it. Um, and a more dull appearance in general. Okay, so those were two venomous, non-venomous comparisons. And now we're gonna switch gears to look at some of our reptile, I'm uh, sorry, amphibians. Um, now these two, upon first look, you might be, well, might be like, they look very different. I don't know how you could ever confuse these two. Well, I'll show you how you can in just a second. So on the top, we have the Cuban tree frog versus the green tree frog on the bottom. The Cuban tree frog is an invasive species. So important to be able to properly identify this 
One thing you can look for, and this is in general with all of our native tree frogs compared to the Cuban tree frog, is the size of the toe pads. So you can see on a native tree frog, they're much smaller compared to that of the Cuban. Very large, and you'll see that in some of these upcoming photos. So fun fact for this slide is all of these frogs are the exact same species. They're all Cuban tree frogs, which is why I told you at the beginning that um, sometimes the coloration alone is not helpful because they can vary significantly. Um, patterns, color, just all around, very different. They do tend to be, I feel like the majority that I've seen have probably been between the middle image and the one on the bottom left. They are, they tend to be kind of lighter in coloration, but you can note the large toe pads that you can see in all of these images here. Another thing they often say with Cuban tree frogs is they have large bulging eyes. So you can kind of make that out here um, and in some of these images. That's not as helpful as the toe pads. Um, another thing is their warty skin. Most of our native tree frogs have very smooth skin. So you can look for the bumpy skin as well. Now, when Cuban tree frogs are young, they do look consistently the same. So that's kind of nice. And they look like this image on um, the top of your screen. They're kind of this olive green color with a lighter green stripe and red eyes, which is an interesting characteristic, but very helpful for identification. They even have the reddish eyes as tadpoles, which you can make out in this image here. And if you so desire to catch what you might think is a Cuban tree frog and flip it over and look at its leg bone, they're said to have a blue leg bone as juveniles. So I think the red eyes alone would be enough, but if you wanna check it out, feel free. <laughs> okay, so why are Cuban tree frogs invasive? This is one reason why. Um, they do eat our native tree frogs. So on the top is the Cuban tree frog versus our green tree frog that we're comparing it to that's getting eaten. I have personally witnessed this myself. Um, they are also able to outcompete our native tree frogs even as tadpoles. So in general, they're able to survive um, and outcompete our native species. You can see in the top left hand side of your screen a map. The Cuban tree frogs are kind of, have slowly been working their range north um, and there's kind of scattered places where they've been found up in the panhandle. So again with, um, you'll kind of notice a theme with some of our invasive species, but with the Cuban tree frog they are much larger than our native species. This is one that my mom sent me a picture of to tell, to ask me, is this a good one or a bad one? And just the size alone, I know you, there's no scale, but it was like five inches long. <laughs> um, and the largest that our, any of our native tree frogs get is about two and a half inches. So if you see anything larger than that, it, size alone can um, help you identify it as a Cuban tree frog. So warty, bumpy skin, you can kind of make out a very large toe pad down here and the bulging eyes. And then this is one of the green tree frog, very smooth skin, not as distinct eyes. And they have this stripe down the side, sometimes more obvious than others. And it's found throughout the state. So we've introduced our first invasive species and it's important that we know exactly what is an invasive species. If you've joined us, for some of our previous webinars, we've asked a similar poll question. Um, but let's ask what you think the definition of an invasive species is. So I'll give you some time to read through those.
All right, I see some answers changing. We're getting most of the votes in. Probably give you 10 more seconds. Okay. So very mixed response. Um, and actually the majority did not get this one correct, though partially correct. So the correct answer is actually the um, bottom option D on your screen, an organism that causes ecological or economic harm or harm to human health in a new environment where it is not native. So the two components that make it invasive is that it's not native and causes harm in some way, shape or form. So, um, but good job, that was somewhat of a trick question, so. <laughs> All right, so let's look at one other comparison, one of which involves an invasive species, and one of which is my favorite. <laughs> so these two are two different species. On the top we have the brown anole, um, also referred to as a Cuban anole, and then on the bottom we have the Carolina anole or also sometimes called the green anole. So we'll explore how they're different. Um, one of which is if you notice the Carolina anole in this picture is green. If we go back here, it's brown. So the <clears throat> Carolina or green anole has the ability to change color. It's not, you know, born as brown or born as green. They can change their color. Um, pretty quickly, in fact, whereas the brown anole cannot. Um, they do come in different colors. Some are super dark, almost black. Some have diamond shapes on their back. Some have stripes. So they vary quite a bit, but they're brown and cannot change green or any color for that matter. Um, another thing to note is their snout. So on the brown anole, it's a much more rounded snout compared to a more pointed um, one on the Carolina or green anole. And then if you have the opportunity to see this part of the lizard, which is called the dewlap, the color of those can be helpful in identifying the two. So on the brown anole, they tend to be um, a much more red color with a lighter color outline compared to that of the green anole which has no outline and tends to be a little bit more pink in color. So, like I said, the green anole is my favorite species. So another way you can um, identify, especially when they're in their green phase, though that's usually helpful alone, but they do have what I call is eyeshadow, definitely not the technical term, but they do have a blue coloration around their eye um, with a white chin and they have, they act to me more like what we would think of as a gecko, just the way that they move. This is not scientific either, just Lara because I love them. And they will like turn their head to look at you in a super cute way. So take that for what it is, but this is our native friend. Okay, and then our last species comparison, just making sure I'm on time, our, is a toad species comparison, which Upon first glance, to me even, these look very similar. Um, but on the top is our native uh, southern toad versus the invasive cane toad, which is also called the marine toad or the bufo toad. So again, here size alone can um, be helpful in differentiating the two. The cane toad can get up to be as much, I think the maximum size they've found is nine inches. I mean, just massive. Um, and the native southern toad, toad doesn't get much more than about three. If you are able to see them up close, you can look for these two characteristics. One is crests on the top of the head. So on the native southern toad, they have these prominent crests that are absent on the cane or bufo toad. And then you can also look for these glands. Both of them have them. The cane toad is no, known for um, harming pets, even possibly killing pets if 
Um, the toxins that are secreted out of this gland uh, are ingested by a cat or dog. It can cause them um, several health issues, including death. So that's a big concern for pet owners. But the shape of that gland on the invasive cane toad is more triangular in shape. It's a larger one um, compared to a smaller oval shaped gland on the native southern toad. And then if you look at these range maps, you can see the native southern toad is found throughout the entire state, whereas the cane toad is kind of sporadic, though in both my county and Shannon's county, um, and expanding their range. So definitely keep an eye out for those, uh, no matter where you are in the state. Um, so, Oh, and I did include this picture. We had our fourth grade teacher here bring in a toad that, uh, cane toad that she found in her neighborhood because she didn't want her dog to find it. Um, so it's a little hard to tell how massive this thing is from this picture, but it was very big. Um, and so we humanely euthanized him and he's now on display. We sent him to a taxidermist, believe it or not. And so we use him for educational purposes about invasive species here at the education center. And so with that, I want to leave time for questions. So that was a few this or that comparisons for some bird, mammal, and reptiles and amphibians.